Welcome again to your small group. Greetings, people of Shiloh. Our scripture today comes from the book of Exodus, and one of the powerful things about Exodus is it's a full story of the people of God finding their next step and their path in life. What I want to lift up is that I'm sitting amidst the reeds, really. They're the tall grasses in front of our church. And very much, the garden in the front of our church is a form of a story garden in a lot of ways. We have a red bush and a patch of green that makes it look like it's a bush that's burning. That's not. So very much that burning bush in Moses' story. We have a tree out front that reminds me of the tree of life in both Revelation and Genesis. And here I am in tall grass, similar to the reeds in this story we hear today. Our story today is the story of Moses' mother, his sister, and of his adopted, adoptive mother. And each of these characters plays an incredible role in the life of who would be the leader of the people of God, a person that teaches us how to follow God even in our own scriptures. But before I share the story of these three incredible women, I want to share with you a thought that comes from Archbishop Desmond Tutu, um, the Archbishop of South Africa and one of those peacemakers in our world. In the early 90s when apartheid was ending but there was still a lot of turmoil in his country, um, Archbishop Tutu was asked if he still had hope for the world. And his response was, I am a prisoner of hope. As Christians, we are prisoners of hope. He referred specifically to Good Friday, the most awful day in our tradition and simultaneously a reminder of what God can do. That Jesus in his love would go all the way to death to prove that God's love is bigger than anything. That God's love is there for us and that faith in Christ, faith of Christ, will help us find that love. And so we find prisoners of hope in our story today. We find a young mother who has born a child, a young man who has been informed by her government, a government that used to be beneficial to them in a time in which they were in famine. The people of Israel found refuge in Egypt. Only later on, the bureaucracies would change, the king would get greedy, and the people were starving and not receiving what they needed. If you study the understanding of the time, it's clear that something fundamental has changed and the people of Israel no longer finding an ability to live free of fear or oppression. And so, many start to say we should rise up violently. Many say they should leave the land, but in all of that, there's a, a government keeping them in place through harsh, harsh punishment including casting their children, their sons, into the river. It's almost a form of genocide. In fact, it really is a way to wipe out a people. And yet, this mother has an ingenious thought, and for us as Christians, it's a Holy Spirit-inspired thought. For people of the world, it's those third ways that we think of that help us to get past the biggest challenges we face. And so instead of disobeying the law that's casting her son into the river, she obeys it, but she does it in a smart way. She takes a wicker basket, lines it with tar so it's waterproof, and puts it in the water. And not only that, she asks her daughter to stay with the basket in the reeds, caring for the child. So you've got this mother who's incredibly intelligent, smart, and able to do this. You have the courage of this young daughter of this mother who stays with her brother to help make sure he is safe. And then you have the third person. We hear this is Pharaoh's daughter, someone in his household that finds Moses and his sister. And here's the thing we should remember. We always feel like this woman had her eyes, wool pulled over her eyes. That somehow she should have known when this young girl went to get Moses' mother that it was somebody different. Um, somebody that uh, they didn't really know it was her mother. 
of the mother of the child. But while we always assume that, I think one of the things we should recognize is the Egyptian woman, I think, knew exactly what was going on. She decided to ally herself on the side of life. She decided to be a prisoner of a hope that the people she saw being destroyed might have a future. And so she took part in that future. She went and asked the young girl to go get Moses' mother. Moses' mother would raise Moses in the Hebrew tradition, and then Moses would be raised in the Egyptian tradition, and we find this incredible hero in our text, who is a son of both kingdoms and neither at the same time, a prisoner that the world might be a better place. And we know Moses' story beyond this to some degree, yet he would free his people and lead them to find God in a way that was powerful for them, for them to trust that God was enough for them. But it took these three inventive, creative prisoners of hope to find their way forward. In our own world, I wonder where we're called to be prisoners of hope to ally ourselves with people that don't have what we have or haven't had the blessing of having what we have. We've been blessed with food and shelter in most of our lives. Some of us maybe have had times of trouble, but many of us have received a lot of blessings, rarely knowing the oppression of the people of Moses. How are we being called to transform the world? And this brings me to a thought about how I am a prisoner of hope for our churches. I am convinced that we have given to churches and to church camps. This is a picture of our church right here, but take a look at this picture. This is a church camp we owned just south of Livingston, Montana, in the Paradise Valley called Luckuck Park. We used to run and have tons of youth and adults go through our camps and learn. We used to have more people in our churches teaching of faith so that when they face times of trial they might have a faith in their lives that they understood and that was deep and in depth. And we've lost that in our culture and in our world. For good or for bad, I do not know. But I'm a prisoner of hope that God might work through the ways in which we've given to these places to create a new understanding of faith in the coming centuries. I'm a prisoner of hope that we might welcome in people who are oppressed, who have received less in this world so that the kingdom of God might be known to them. They might become prisoners of hope. I am convinced and a prisoner of hope that we might find people right around our church that don't have a sense of faith, of hope that the world could be a better place, that they're not prisoners of hope either. I have faith that we can teach people like these women to think of the third way, to be inventive and creative so the next generation of leaders might help transform this world in hope. Friends, I as your pastor am a prisoner of hope. And I wonder, where are you being called to be that prisoner of hope? Don't be dumbfounded by this. Know that God is with us in this. It will take work, and it's challenging. But I believe by being prisoners of hope, our world and our lives and our churches and our camps and our world itself over and over will be transformed in God's love. So go from here, friends. And I invite you as you discuss this to consider both, or excuse me, all three, not both, all three characters that remind us of the prisoner of hope that they each are. Think about where they come from and who they are that brought them to that point. God bless you as you continue this journey.